Carolyn Brockway, yep. who is herself a very special guest of this conference. <laughs> Um, a postdoc that will be joining my lab later this year, which I'm very excited about, and made the trip from Calgary to join us and warm up a little bit. Right? It's minus 45 in Calgary. Just be happy you're not there. Uh, so welcome, Mary Lee. I'm looking forward to the next session. And uh, for those who are still uh, trying, there are still two scarves available, so keep going with your bingos, and we'll see what happens later in the afternoon. Thank you, Megan, and thank you for the opportunity to join us. So we have our third panel uh, of the day, and we're going to be hearing from Natalie Shanker, uh, Tina Chambers, and Aloka Patel. Um, and we're going to be discussing innovative approaches to human milk banks, biorepositories, and education. So our first speaker will be Natalie Shanker. Um, Natalie is formally trained as a doctor, and um, <laughs> she uh, has done research around pediatric, well, she's doing pediatric surgery and then the experience of having children move your interest, like most of it does, into um, breastfeeding and human milk. Uh, she is the co-founder and director of the Hearts Milk Bank uh, in the UK. And I've had the privilege of meeting with her once over Skype, so it's been very nice to meet her in person and talk about her uh, exciting work with human donor milk and her enthusiasm around human donor milk is, is contagious and very exciting, so please uh, welcome that. I just want to say a very, a very heartfelt thanks to the organisers for inviting me to this incredible meeting. I feel like the new girl in town. Uh, I've really been working in the field for five years, um, initially in research, but um, my story is probably not unique in that I trained as a doctor um, and was incredibly driven by learning about developmental biology and children's health, and I'm quite naturally an impatient person. So those skills seem to combine naturally to uh, go into pediatric surgery, um, which is what I did. And it was really the experience of working in peds under system and grade pressure, the NHS, which has incredible values, but also incredible funding pressures, and seeing the impact that that could make on the patients I was caring for made me take some time out and step into research. And I did a master's in developmental biology at Imperial College and realized that while I've been slaving away in the operating theatre, that science has really moved on and the field of epigenetics was really coming to the fore. So I stepped out into a PhD at Imperial looking at epigenetic biomarkers of cancer risk and uh, along the way had some frustrations with my research as many people doing PhDs do and did the only sensible thing and had a baby. Um, <laughs> this is Sophia who's now six and uh, very good. But what it really plunged me into was the world of being a mum and infant feeding. And I went from being the very typical UK medic, which is almost having a step of brow with the <laughs> counselor, who told me that every woman in the world can breastfeed and you know, um, being able to challenge that, to really being on my knees immediately after a very difficult birth and finding that uh, the support around breastfeeding <coughs> was limited to um, I liked having babies so much we did it again, and this is proof of research. I can't always predict what comes out the next time, and Ariel is intensely curious she was here for the weeks. But what becoming a mum also did was mean that I ended up with a very supply of milk eventually. And a friend came around one day and said, Well, you can delay that. And I said, What are for? And it's <laughs> important to know that I've been a pediatric surgeon working on neonatal units, including in Oxford, where I've trained, which has had a milk bank for 16 years. Still didn't know that service existed, and this is how siloed the, these services are in the UK. So, working on epigenetics, we needed a cell source of breast cells, and as Lars Boat has already highlighted, it's possible to extract mammary epithelial cells from breast milk, and that led on to uh, uh, some pilot research I did as part of my PhD, which showed that we could not only extract and characterize these cells as being predominantly mammary epithelial cells, but we could do some very high-level molecular biology and start defining risk markers of breast cancer risk in this population of cells, which basically gives us a way to develop the future breast screening tools. But to do this research, we need two things. We need a functional milk bank network, and we need some money. And by the end of 2015, we had neither. The milk bank services in the UK, in the southeast in particular, had large 
partially through the effect of NHS constraints uh, being cut down to the bare minimum. Uh, there were many hospitals that didn't have access to uh, donor milk. There were, were only 15 milk banks in the whole country. And something had to be done. And so rather than going off and doing a standard postdoc, I decided to use my skills um, to a different effect. And that led to the creation of the Hearts Milk Bank. Now, Hearts is set up with Gillian Weaver, who's one of the foremost experts internationally in human milk banking. She's been involved in the field from dietetic and running the milk bank for 30 years. But it's brought together a huge team of people to make this possible. And we're the first independent, non-profit human milk bank in the UK. And what that means is that we're free of a relative amount of bureaucracy and we can grow relatively quickly. So, um, Human milk banks, if you're not aware, I'm sure most of you are, provide screened donated breast milk from mothers who undergo substantial screening, much of it they were donating blood, uh, and donate their surplus milk. Either because they are home and things are going relatively well and they have an oversupply, or that their baby's in hospital and they build up a surplus while that baby's being cared for and not needing as much of their mother's milk. Some of those babies also don't make it, they die, and being able to donate milk for some women can be an absolute So we're based just north of London in the Rothamsted Research Institute, which is a food security institute. It gives us great transport links. Um, and the team is building, you can see from this picture from our Christmas uh, dinner, uh, that we are starting to, to grow hugely. And this is basically what we've achieved. So we started providing donor milk to hospitals in the middle of 2017, and over 18 months have supplied uh, over 500 litres. And we're looking to grow on that. And the growth is really coming from hospitals liberalizing their use policies. At the moment, if it's used at all, it's restricted to babies typically under 28 weeks gestation, sometimes 30, sometimes 32. But there's a real inequality in what's available to parents. Um, but it's also coming from hospitals who've never used it and are starting to look at it. But we've always had a surplus of mums wanting to donate milk. And so an oversupply of our own of donor milk. And what do we do? throw it down the drain. Um, and we started to get phone calls. Phone calls from women who'd had bilateral vasectomies, who'd had uh, breast cancer diagnosed during pregnancy or other reasons that they couldn't breastfeed at all. And their only choice was to use formula from the start. So even though we had hammered the message that breast is best for some women, that will never be possible, no matter how much support is available. And I'll gloss over the research um, education profile that we're building, um, except to say that the profile can be absolutely phenomenal. We had a visit from the Malaysian Department of Health for 10 days to come and look at a, a new style of milk banking service, um, and the report that that generated led to the Ministry for Islamic Affairs in Malaysia lifting the embargo on putting the first human milk banks in, and we're hopeful that the first Malaysian non-profit milk bank will be created next year as a result. So, the small ripples that we're starting to create are really building together. But our big problem is we still have no money. <laughs> and being able to attract money into this sector, either in research or because nobody's ever heard of a milk bank, has been hugely difficult. And while we've been growing as a social enterprise, uh, which is a non-profit business really, we've been developing a charity alongside. And the role of the charity is really to fund the donor milk into the community, because we cannot convince the NHS that this is something that should be funded. 20% of babies, they say, in the UK never get access to their mum's milk. So what makes that baby with that mother special? And so there's a lot of work to do, but we're hoping that by building the evidence base and building the cases, we can start to um, present that in some families it can be hugely important. So anyone who's ever set up a business of any sort or a charity will know that cash flows are key it's a little bit scary when the first four months you're about a quarter of what you're expecting to send out. So this graph really shows um, a journey of uh, a tremendous uh, triumph in the face of adversity, whereas we were um, falling substantially short of what we were, we were hoping to provide in hospitals. But we, we overcame it and we got through. And now we're finding, as I said, the number of hospitals using donor milk is increasing. Even in units that believe the consultants said that they would never use donor milk and that uh, it was effectively dishwater, which is interesting. Uh, the first hospital that used it uh, from our milk bank, they never used it before, uh, found that the maternal breastfeeding rates on discharge had gone from 60% to 80% within a year of use. And really, when I go out and talk to medics about milk bank services, most of the debate in the UK has centered on the ability 
countries around randomization and our trials powered enough has actually missed one of the biggest opportunities in the use of donor milk, and that is where it is used appropriately to support mums. It can help reduce the anxiety that they're feeling and support their own blood supply to come in. We've had cases where I've been called on a Friday night by an intimate feeding lead on a postnatal ward with a mum who's delivered at 36 weeks and is stressed because she's got no milk supply. Could they go and steal a couple of bottles off the NICU? Place it for free without telling anybody because we've not funded. So, what are you going to do? I said, yes. And then they called back on Monday and said, we went to tell the mum and we never had to use the donor milk because two hours later, her breast became gorged and it came in. And that's what we're finding time and time again. So, we've now supported over 50 families. Should say 15 of those never received donor milk at all, but they got lactation support through our lactation consultants who work in the milk bank. We've supported a range of indications. All sorts of things. No mum taking antipsychotics has ever been able to access donor milk in the UK because it simply wasn't enough. Um, but also very particular cases where the mother has died or where the mother has terminal cancer diagnosed during pregnancy, it's made an incredible impact for the blind family. I just wanted to focus on one clinical case because we talk a lot about personalization and milk is so incredibly variable that if we're not talking about it, then we're probably misattributing uh, milk back. Services. But this was uh, a very special family where the baby was born prematurely, no antenatal problems, but then collapsed at two months of age with seizures and repeated seizures, status epilepticus, and ended up intubated and was diagnosed with a condition called Benke syndrome, which is a copper deficiency. Um, he, sorry, it's an uncomfortable <coughs> pictures, but um, he suffered. Um, so many seizures that he was basically endlessly sedated. And mum had initiated breastfeeding at birth, but no one in her family had ever breastfed. She'd never um, thought it was something she was going to do. She hadn't breastfed her first baby. And so after three or four days, she stopped. Her baby was exclusively fed with formula. A formula supplement with zinc. And the zinc copper transport system is reciprocal. And what was happening is the high levels of zinc were expunging more copper this is from the neurologist, then was, um, then was good. And for this baby, even though clinically people with his genetic mutation typically present after six months, he presented at two months and was given a prognosis of a couple of months. So she was told to go and relactate and that her milk would be best for the baby. And she sat at home for three weeks trying to do this on her own with no access to any support and eventually collapsed in a heap and started Googling milk. So she called us and we sent some milk down within a couple of hours. Unfunded, we've just basically given away everything we had spare. And um, I went down to see the baby a week later to see what was happening. And what was happening was quite remarkable. She not had to use rescue medazolam, the sedative, to rescue this baby for that whole week. Uh, and she was starting to wean down his baseline anti-epileptic medication. And to cut a long story short, she started sending some pictures where the baby is doing remarkably well. He's now not on any medication at all. He's been exclusively donor milk fed for two and a half months. She hasn't been able to relactate. She's got enormous pressures going on, knowing that her baby still has very limited life expectancy. He hasn't been to hospital. He hasn't needed intensive care medication to save the NHS absolutely thousands, and it's got an enormous amount. And this is what we're saying, is that actually we need to be thinking much more broadly about how milk is used. And the interesting thing about personalization, which I wanted to pull out, is that the milk that came for this baby was predominantly from a set of much older mums. In the UK, every milk bank stops recruiting a mum when their baby gets to six months and won't take milk after nine months or a year. So when a baby gets to a year, the milk bank rings the donor and says, I'm sorry, that's it, well done, all good. It's sending a very subliminal message that milk is no good after that age. So we scrapped that. There's no evidence base for it. And Marianne Perrin's work showing that actually antimicrobial factors go up over the second year of lactation uh, seemed to make a lot of sense. So this baby was getting milk from much older mums who were a reserve for community babies. Now we also know from Marianne Perrin's work, it's only limited 
enable research to be done. And we were approached by the Parenting Science Gap, which was a citizen science, welcome, trust funded uh, research group in the UK who wanted to answer questions that the community had asked. And one thing they all wanted to know was composition of breast milk over a natural breast milk lactation. And we wanted to know that too because we were using this milk and we needed to know what's in it. So I started working with Simon Cameron, who's a colleague at Imperial College.
pregnancy outcome uh, cohort study. So we enroll uh, many of those women in uh, studies and follow them longitudinally. Um, but one of the issues that we come up with, as you can imagine, is lack of data uh, about pregnancy exposures and even more uh, seriously lack of data about lactation exposures. And you know, in terms of what this means for the woman um, and the baby, um, oftentimes we hear people say they will not breastfeed because they have to take a medication or they will not take a medication because they want to breastfeed. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics says that a common reason for breastfeeding cessation is use of a medication um, and, and, uh, and the moms are advised by their physicians to stop nursing if they take the drug, um, typically on the basis of no information or incorrect information. So we know from survey data, um, and this uh, speaks strongly to me, um, that women oftentimes, this is from an Italian survey published a few years ago, uh, in response to a number of questions, for example, women believed that natural products were safer than drugs and preferred to endure pain rather than take pain relieving medications while breastfeeding, again, on the basis of likely no information um, or, or inaccurate information. And women in that sample expressed concern. They really didn't know how to manage breastfeeding when pharmacotherapy was needed. Uh, we published a couple of studies in the last few years. One was a survey that we appended to a study on influenza vaccine uh, in a study that we did over several years following the 2009 pandemic um, in the US. And we found that about a, a quarter of women said they would be unlikely to get an influenza vaccine while breastfeeding. Um, and most commonly, their reason uh, for avoiding it was due to safety concerns. Again, uh, no data to support that. And we find it with prescription medications as well. This was a survey of, of uh, 466 pregnant women enrolled in our cohort study, about half of whom were taking SSRIs for depression or other psychiatric disorders and they were significantly less likely to initiate breastfeeding than those who were not taking the medications. Um, we don't know for sure that that's the reason why they didn't breastfeed, but uh, uh, certainly could be one. Um, and there's also tremendous lack of consensus in the guidance uh, that's provided, which I guess makes sense in the absence of data. Um, so this is just a, a paper that looked at a series of um, antihypertensive medications and discrepancies between what the guidance was uh, from the European Medicines Agency compared to the FDA, and even between the two primary experts in this area. And in the last couple of years, this is be becoming more, um, I think, in the awareness of uh, practitioners uh, since the introduction of the pregnancy and lactation labeling final rules. So the US FDA, about two years ago, uh, changed the uh, uh, format and what the content is that's required in all prescription drugs uh, to remove the ABCDX classification for pregnancy and to require that the lactation section actually have something in it. And so the lactation section now says for every product there has to be a risk summary, which says what are the known risks. There has to be a clinical consideration section if minimizing exposure, if there's a strategy for that and monitoring for adverse reactions. And then there's a section that's supposed to contain the data, and human data trumps animal data. Um, so clearly, as these labels end up being rewritten, and it'll be, these will all be finalized for drugs marketed since the year 2000, um, by next year, there will be a big blank space where uh, the lactation data uh, supporting the known risks exist. And this is a question that, to me, is pretty easily answered. It's not rocket science. Um, the actual data on medications in human milk are limited, especially for new drugs. Um, and even though we have good resources, uh, such as LACMED, um, it's oftentimes the information that's contained in there is based on the few case reports or what, what is speculated based on uh, the known properties of the drug. So this was sort of the initial impetus for establishing Mommy's Milk Human Re uh, Milk Research Biorepository at the University of California, San Diego. Um, to help address this question, because the simple first question, does the drug or the agent or whatever even get into the breast milk, and if it does, at what quantities, that that seems like a question that we should have the answer to for every product uh, that's marketed or taken by women uh, who are of uh, the reproductive age and might be breastfeeding. So this was established in 2014, like Natalie, this was a charity, continues to be a charity, uh, to help address uh, questions regarding breastfeeding exposures. And then the broader goal, um, as it turns out, um, and, I, and 
and equally as important is to support other research efforts uh, locally, locally, nationally, and globally. So the design, just briefly to go over this, is we, uh, women uh, provide informed consent. Um, they're asked to contribute at least a 50 milliliter milk sample up to a full pump, but we'll take whatever they'll give us. Uh, we collect locally so they can come into uh, our research offices um, or we have, have research assistants at uh, newborn nurseries or the NICU uh, in town where the, uh, samples can be collected. Um, but the vast majority of these, um, at least since we started this, have been coming from bail samples um, that women send a kid and women collect the samples and send them to us um, from, from all over the U.S. and Canada. Um, we aliquot them and then they're uh, stored um, at UCSD and inventory there for future use. Um, the recruitment sources, I mentioned we run these pregnancy uh, longitudinal cohort studies, so that's a, a natural. So a woman enrolls with us because she's taking a new medication for migraine and she uh, agrees to be followed through her pregnancy and then as she gets towards the end of the pregnancy and we're capturing information about the end of the pregnancy, we ask about her breastfeeding practices um, and if she is breastfeeding, we ask her if she'll participate in the breast milk repository. And that way we get people who are exposed to the medication and those who are not. Uh, we recruit widely through social media. And as was mentioned before, it, it's an amazing you know, avenue for doing this. Um, it's a, um, we've had a, so, a social media ad that's resulted in three or 400 women a day who responded wanting to participate in the breast milk repository. Um, I mentioned the newborn nurseries, and then we partner, um, although we're not a, a part of the same uh, donor milk bank as Natalie described, we partner with a, a duly established San Diego uh, donor milk bank um, so that uh, women who are uh, participating in the donor milk bank whose milk doesn't qualify due to a medication or other exposure they've had, um, they're asked if they will be willing to participate in the, the research uh, component and then become part of the uh, uh, research by a repository, and then women who have additional milk and do qualify for the uh, donor milk bank can give that additional milk to the repository with uh, consent. And then we also are partnering with, um, and this is kind of a pilot thing, with the San Diego Blood Bank uh, in uh, San Diego County, uh, which is unique in that it has, maybe it's not unique, but it's a ni nice partnership because they have facilities um, all over the county. Um, and they say anywhere in the county you're within 10 minutes of a blood bank facility, um, and they have the resources to be able to uh, uh, capture the samples for us and be able to do it in the community rather than having people have to come in to see us. So we collect a wide variety of information from these moms, demographics, um, questions about maternal and child health and their pregnancy uh, uh, experiences and events and exposures and breastfeeding habits and the circumstances under which the samples were collected. Uh, we do a 14-day recall, uh, day by day, about exposures to recreational drugs, alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, prescription medications, and over-the-counter drugs. Um, and uh, uh, vitamins and minerals, and uh, dose uh, uh, and the timing and uh, indication. Um, with Bill Anderson and black men, we've uh, developed an adverse reaction checklist that the mothers respond to about the previous 14 days. And then they go online and they're asked to fill out uh, standard uh, stress, anxiety, and depression scales and a brief uh, block food frequency questionnaire. And then depending on how old their child is when they enroll, uh, there are male neurobehavioral questionnaires uh, between 12 and 36 months. And then for a subset, and this is because this is all we can afford, we have a, a neuropsychologist who supervises two psychometrists who do face-to-face -face testing uh, for children who are, are local or can uh, be brought in. And then they provide access to medical records. So on an uh, annual basis, the, um, they release medical records for the mother and the child, and they agree to be contacted up to two times a year uh, for additional studies. So, so far, how we've uh, uh, tried to move this forward is we've set up a steering committee for governance that uh, Lars sits on, and we have the, the blanket IRB approval for the repository to continue to accumulate samples, and then as each project for analysis comes along, we submit an addendum for that specific analysis, so it goes pretty quickly. Uh, we have a, a standard material transfer agreement in process for sample distribution or for samples being sent to us um, if they're coming from a, uh, in a larger group from another institution. Um, and we've established a website, which I'll say
say a little bit more about, and then with some seed funding um, from Lars' uh, group and a, and a couple of other investigators at UCSD um, are in the process of completing a descriptive analysis of the first 600 samples on a number of different um, measures. So the website, um, if you want to explore it, um, is uh, mommysmellresearch.org. Uh, RTI uh, put this together for us, and it gives you a description of the number of mothers. It's now a, a little over 1,400 uh, who participated. It tells you uh, some characteristics of the samples, the age at which, um, what, how old the child was when the sample was collected, whether it was a singleton or a multiple, whether it was a premature birth, um, race, ethnicity, BMI of the mom, and if you click on the state, you can see the distribution of the samples by that state um, and some other demographic characteristics. So moving forward, our objectives are to identify investigators who have compatible research interests and to collaborate with them on grant proposals um, from a scientific standpoint and also from a, a, a sustainability standpoint. And we have uh, been, are gaining you know, knowledge that the thing exists and people approaching us. So we've had some uh, requests and proposals submitted um, from a variety of different places uh, uh, throughout the world, actually. Um, and then for other projects, we, uh, what we want to do is serve as a biobank resource um, to vet the feasibility of research ideas and then to provide samples for those studies that are really outside the scope of our interests but can help uh, support uh, um, uh, good research being conducted elsewhere. Um, we're able to modify the design for special studies. So for example, uh, collecting fresh milk samples instead of uh, uh, aliquoting and freezing. Uh, we have a study where the investigator wanted to be able to collect repeated samples and wanted to be able to get associated saliva samples before and after breastfeeding from the infant. So we modified the, the protocol for, for that uh, special circumstance. And then I think importantly, and this is, uh, Lars and I have talked about this a lot, that we, what we want to be able to do also is set a standard or agree upon a set of standards about how uh, biorepositories maybe could be um, uh, organized um, and structured and processes and procedures set up so that multiple repositories around the world would have comparable uh, types of samples that potentially could be pooled or would be able to be compared. And then uh, test hypotheses regarding sample collection procedures, processes, uh, processing, and storage effects on sample quality. So uh, funding, of course, has been a struggle, as everybody said here repeatedly. Um, there is a, a, a pilot study funded by NICHD in the US uh, through the Pediatric Trials Network, and they're piloting 10 uh, target drugs um, at 20 sites, one of which is at sick kids with Shinya Ito and the other 19 in the US. Um, and this is just to determine is it feasible to be able to get a sample, a breast milk sample, uh, either a newborn or a, a mother's blood sample or both um, for one of these 10 drugs and then to be able to, um, as an option, be able to collect additional information um, from those moms. And so we've just started, embarked on that. Um, we get some infrastructural support from the uh, Clinical and Translational Science Award that comes to the university um, and with, uh, gotten some uh, pilot funding for satellite uh, equipment and staffing for the blood bank collections. And we've established a recharge mechanism so people who want to use um, samples um, for projects that are um, outside our scope uh, can, can pay for sample, which, was, which helps a little bit. Um, we published a, a study uh, a few months ago um, on uh, serendipitously, I guess you could say this, um, that we uh, identified that we had quite a few samples where mothers were reporting marijuana use um, that were in the biorepository and a lack of data about this. So just a very few case reports and one small uh, kind of experimental study that Tom Hale's group uh, published last year. Um, so we wanted to do the first pass, which is to see if cannabinoids are measurable in human milk following maternal marijuana use um, in, by today's standards, and then uh, look at the relationship between uh, cannabis concentrations and dose and timing. So we had 54 samples in the repository um, for 46 women, and uh, in collaboration with the uh, School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, looked at uh, four metabolites um, and just a description that these were moms who were breastfeeding 
infants from uh, zero to more than 12 months of age. Um, and they were primarily uh, daily users. Um, so uh, for all, more than 80% were using at least once a day and primarily by inhalation. And so we found that uh, Delta 9 THC was detectable um, in 63% of the samples, and the other metabolites, at a very small number, were detectable. And um, as might be expected, the hours since last use, the reported use of uh, cannabis, um, was the strongest predictor of being able to measure the level, and that the detectable level declined with the number, number of hours since last use, but with the last one. Uh, being about six days after reported last use. So opportunities and challenges. Practically, I mentioned social media and then the existing studies we have where we piggyback this on there. We have far more demand than we can handle. We've actually had to um, uh, put a sort of a stop and contact people and say, um, we're gonna put you on a waiting list if you're still breastfeeding because we can't afford all of the samples that uh, people would like to be able to give. Um, there, of course, would be highly desirable to have associated blood samples um, with these, but there's challenges in, in capturing those. Um, and we would have a desire to want to enrich um, the number of samples we're getting from moths who are feeding preemies. Um, these, the, even the few studies that have been done uh, in, with the FDA uh, helping to guide the design in the past year or so have excluded preemies and looking at whether or not um, breastfeeding taking a particular drug may cause a problem. And so that excludes being able to answer the question, is, is, would there uniquely be a problem or something to be concerned about if it was a premature infant? And then the costs and logistics of long-term follow-up. Um, methodologically, these samples are convenient samples. They're not collected under uh, controlled conditions uh, by and large. And we have methodologic issues, which I think are going to be really interesting ones to uh, address uh, separating the effects of prenatal exposure from postnatal. So I'll end there. Thank you very much.
And human milk in the big use in the U.S. have been increasing. This just shows that over time there's been increase in use of milk. But there's a huge range. With some states, they're very high users. Some states are very low. And in this diagram here, it combines donor milk and breast milk. What's interesting is a recent study out of um, MPANC looked at 600, over 600 NICUs. And they looked at the area that the NICU is located and looked at the racial makeup of that, that zip code and whether or not they were in the higher than the average black population or lower than the average black population for the country. And what we found, or what we found, what they found was that there was a significant difference based on where you live. So while 75% of infants, of, of NICUs would provide some mother's own milk to their babies, if you looked at a population where there were more black infants, those NICUs had lower rates of getting mother's own milk. And it was the same when they looked at donor milk. So it's not just at an individual level, it's at an institutional level that you see differences. We looked at data from other published studies, and here what you're seeing is the solid bars are the rates of initiation. And in almost all of those, you can see that black mothers in the black color are at a lower rate than white mothers. The striped bars are the rates of continuing to discharge from the NICU. And once again, you see a significant drop off and still a very strong racial disparity. The only outlier is the study from Connecticut by Brownell, but everyone else has shown similar findings. And why does this happen? So the mothers who deliver babies in the NICU, especially the very low birth weight babies, these are less than 1,500 grams, they have a lot of reasons for challenges. First and prim primarily is delayed lactogenesis, so all of these factors that are listed there. But then they have other barriers that you may not consider. So they're separated from their infants. There's a tremendous stress that these mothers face in the NICU. Depending on the institution, there may not be any skin to skin, although I think more and more institutions are doing that as soon as the infant is stable, and hopefully within the first few days if possible. They're breast pump dependent, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about breast pumps, but it's been primarily as a adjunct, that mother's breastfeeding. She needs a couple hours here, a couple hours there. These women spend months entirely dependent on a breast pump with no direct breastfeeding. Um, the cost of this equipment, the lack of knowledge, training um, of their peers as well as the hospital staff, their own health issues. In the US, unfortunately, maternity leave is a huge problem. Transportation, competing responsibilities, and embarrassment. So we did a cohort study a few years ago where we looked at the health outcomes and the cost benefit. And when I looked at that data, as we were looking at it a little bit more closely, I realized our initiation rates were fantastic. 98% of these women, 50% black women, all initiated practically breast milk. But when I started looking at who was going home on breast milk, there was a huge disparity. And so this is what prompted the study that we just published recently. And so it's 415, it's a cohort of 415 mothers. And it's just a kind of demographic, so who they are. You can see about 50% are black, about 30% are, um, are Hispanic. And so it's primarily a minority population. And 74% are WIC eligible. So this is a disadvantaged population in terms of low SCS. And we found that despite um, these great initiation rates, when you looked at what they were doing, you can see that overall none of our, our outcomes are not great. I'm not going to pretend they are. 98% initiated, about 40% go home still providing breast milk. And this is 70 days on average, 70, 75 days after the baby's born. But despite that, the black moms are sitting in a 20% range compared to the other two, the Hispanic and the white. And that's really what really worried me and wanted to understand why, and that's what prompted my research. And so this just gives you a little bit of an idea of where we are. So we're situated in Chicago, and this map shows you the SES profile. So the lighter the color, the lower the income rate. And then this overlap map is, is rushed. And this is where all these 415 mothers came from. And you can see the vast majority come from areas that are low income. So I'm going to go over the study a little bit. So this was our model. We started to think of what are all the different types of factors that can impact this. And so we looked at social factors. We looked at neighborhood structural factors like crime and zip code, um, access to lactation care. We looked at like how close is the neighborhood lactation support, even though all these women received very intensive care counselor lactation support in the NICU, but it still is a marker of the environment that they're coming from and the culture they're coming from. We looked at mom's health factors, their pumping factors, how often do they pump, uh, what kind of pump do they use. And then we looked at demographics and infant factors. And um, just to 
go to the end, what we found that looking at all these factors were really not in the end in our models of predicting who goes home still pumping was maternal age. These aren't surprising. Low SDS, race, whether or not she's getting support from her breastfeeding or breastfeeding from her mother. This is the one that surprised me. That when a woman said, my, my mother, my the baby's grandmother supports me, her likelihood of breastfeeding to discharge was actually lower. And that was a big surprise to me. The number of times she pumps over the first 14 days and whether or not she hit 500 milliliters per day of breastfeeding. So most of these are not surprising. The only one that surprised me was the mother's mother's outcome. And so our next step was really, the whole focus of this study was to look at what's mediating this difference between black and white mothers. And what we found was that between black and white mothers, almost all of it was explained by three factors. Maternal age, low SDS, and daily pumping frequency. And so some of these you can't really modify, but I would argue that maybe two of them you can. Although most people would say not really, just one. Um, but when we looked at Hispanic mothers, they consistently outproduced the other two. When you accounted for everything else, in terms of maternal age and daily pumping frequency, there was still an unaccounted factor that their rates of breastfeeding and discharge were higher than black moms, and closer, if not higher, than white moms. So I think this brought me back to looking at the literature some more and saying, what are the, what are the barriers that these mothers face? So, lack of access to information that promotes and supports breastfeeding, even though I think we do a pretty good job of that in our NICU. Lack of support from family, the healthcare community, a negative perception of breastfeeding in the black community that's been reported in many um, qualitative studies, the necessity to return to work, usually at a much earlier time than their white counterparts, and a low SDS. And so this has got us thinking about some potential interventions, so enhanced breastfeeding programs, hospital-based programs, um, support, finding ways to uh, increase support from the family and friends. And then my other area that I'm going to talk about a little bit later is how to make breastfeeding more of the norm. That's something that I'm very interested in. So coming back to that diagram, I'm going to talk about a couple of just initiatives that we've done and looking at health systems and family and community. And so the first that some of you have heard me talk about that I'm really excited about is the Baby or Pump QI project that's been going on in our unit for over a year now. And the second is an economic intervention randomized control trial that we will find out in a few days whether or not we have funding for because the council is meeting as we speak right now. But I'm very, very hopeful and have my fingers crossed. And I think that would be really exciting to really tackle that SDS barrier. And all the interventions have been designed to really overcome those and see if it makes a difference in these um, mothers who have babies in the NICU. So for the baby or pump QI, this work has been led by a couple of uh, my colleagues. And what it's based on is Leslie Parker's data showing that in pump-dependent mothers, if you can get them to start pumping within the first hour after birth, their milk volume sorry, is much higher down the road, three to six weeks later. It's not just something that happens in the short term and is then um, evens out. So we have a QI specialist who's Dr. Panagos, and she's done this lovely um, Ishikawa diagram that kind of looks at all the different factors and has developed many of these cycles. And when we looked at work together with OB and labor and delivery of how can we get mothers pumping within an hour, finding that most of those women have had a cesarean section, they're still in the operating room an hour after that baby's born. So you have to do it in the operating room. And that's been a big challenge. So we centralized supplies, figured out where you plug in a pump in the operating room how to get the nurses to make sure they're documenting correctly, fix the electronic medical record system, and then providing education prenatally to the L&D staff, to the mothers and the fathers. And the way we have um, rolled it out is that we'll have them put the pump on pretty much initially, soon after the baby is delivered. We have OB anesthesia so as one of our champions, the obstetricians are champions, and the nurses are champions. So put the pump on immediately after, as, as long as the mother's stable. We haven't done anyone with general anesthesia. And either the family does it, so fathers have been really excited to be the ones who are in the room and holding the pumps. If they're not available, the grandmothers. If they're not available, the nurses. But it's something that the mothers are prepared for before they go in, so they know. And that's been something that we've been working through. And this graph just shows you that whereas we had about for time to first pump was on average maybe about I mean, there's a case up to 80 hours, but I think it was closer to about 30 hours. Now we're down to under three hours. And it's been sustained now. This graph ends at 76 moms, but we're down, I think we're up to about 125 moms, and we're working on this, uh, putting this together as a publication. But we're really excited. So 
So we know they're pumping faster. We're still collecting the data to say, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's impacting time that we're speeding? Does it mean it impacts how long these babies are getting breast milk? Um, the next areas that I've been excited about has been really tackling that family and community dimension. And that's completely out of my element, right? I work in the NICU, I work with these families, but I don't go outside of the hospital. Um, and so one thing that I was interested in was this whole concept we talked about is childhood education. How do we make it normal? It shouldn't be something that the first time a woman hears about it is as she's delivering, she goes to a prenatal class, maybe like, like I think Cammy's story, right? The nurse in the delivery suite. So that's an issue and I'd like to change that. So we did a small pilot study and um, looking at childhood education. And so, so far most of the education studies have focused on pregnant women, teenagers, high school or beyond. There are very few that have looked at younger ages. Um, there have been reports that have looked at teachers and administrators' views and identified a lot of barriers, like it's not appropriate, you'll encourage pregnancy, I don't have the knowledge base to provide this. Um, but it's really, you know, it's exciting, and I think Megan shared this with me, that Ireland and I found another school district in the UK now have a breastfeeding curriculum in their pre-adolescent, adolescent ages. I found one for New York that's no longer, I can't find it anymore. I found, I don't know if you know, it's, it was listed, and now I can't find it at all. I don't know if anyone else has ever seen that, but it was rather sad that it's disappeared. So what we did was a small pilot study that we called Mother's Milk and Mammals, and um, really tried to make lactation a part of science curriculum, and not to, not to link it with sex ed. Because I think children and adolescents don't want to think about sex. Look at the breast as a sexual entity anyway. Try to move it more to the norm, but it has another purpose. It's not all about sex. So we enrolled 43 um, fourth to fifth grade students who were enrolled in a, like an extracurricular science class that was run by, our, uh, by the medical students in our, in our institution and would come once a week for class. And we just took a 30 minute session on one day and we ran it twice for half the groups, about 20 kids per class. We developed a questionnaire that looked at breast milk science like what's in breast milk, is it nutritious, those kinds of things, what, which animals lactate for how long, and then attitudes, is breast milk good for you, those kinds of things. And we gave it to the students three times, once just before starting the class, just after start, ending class, and then a month later. And it was an interesting study to do. The, the, invest, the person who led it is my resident right there, George, and so he led the sessions, um, so that was consistent as well. And what we found in this is that, I, oh, okay, one minute. I think mostly what we found is that because this was a self-selected science group, overall the children came in with a positive attitude towards breastfeeding. But that positive attitude for the most part stayed. The knowledge definitely stayed. They were very excited to learn about animals. But some of the attitudes kind of regressed a little bit by the time they had left. But what I found the most exciting was that when we asked them should breastfeeding information be taught in schools, that number went up. It may not be statistically significant, but the kids were excited. And these were half boys, half girls. We saw no difference based on, you know, kids, boys had their arms up just as much as the girls. And we ran it like a Jeopardy game, and they were so engaged, had so much fun. So I think it's something we should think about more as a society, which once again, is not my hat at all, but something that I was interested in. So um, just in summary, my main research questions, I would say, are really focusing on disparity. Um, I think what I'm really excited about is this randomized trial. We're able to start it. I'm looking for partnerships. I think funding is a huge issue for everybody. And I think that trying to prove even milk is beneficial isn't something we need to work, about, to work on so much. It's really how to get that message out, how to get people to change their behavior. That's the hard part. So, thank you.
how far. Absolutely. So we have two SOPs, one for the uh, milk collection that takes place in our offices under controlled conditions, and one for the mail collections. Um, and we would be happy to share them with anyone. I think that's, like I was saying, that's one of our goals, is to say, well, what is, um, you know, what is the optimum way to do this? Or if we don't know what it is, let's test what would be optimum. And if there's a third or a fourth way of doing it, should we be allocating a certain segment of the samples to be done those other ways so that it makes it possible to collaborate? That would be a terrific opportunity for us. Hi, I'm Okai Bluff. Well, I loved all of your talks, but I have a question specifically for you. I'm so struck by the disparities when I know what an amazing job Rush specifically does with supporting women. Have you guys considered or are you looking into any potential genetic factors or hormonal responses and how black moms are perhaps responding to the stress of the CPU differently? That's, uh, we have not built that into the RCT, but I think that would be really interesting that if the study is funded, to then to be able to add on to it. Because I think things to look at are, you know, milk composition while we're doing this, looking at these hormonal factors, um, looking at long-term outcomes. I think if we are doing this RCT, we see a difference in long-term outcomes in terms of provision, then that's a nice model, kind of like studies to say, what's the impact on the mother, what's the impact on the baby beyond the NICU stay. Um, so I think if we have funding, we would be very interested in collaborating with others to see what else we can put in there. And hopefully I'll know soon as to where this is going. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Lee.
breastfeeding or breastfeeding and mothering. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So that kind of and I'm asking yeah. about stepmothers kind of made me think of that because it could be that like those paternal grandparents are going to be more focused on the baby and less with like and I have that got that in yeah. the African American literature also that yeah. the paternal grandmother is very different than the maternal grandmother. Yeah. Um, so looking at your mediation model, whenever I see those disparities, the one thing that never comes up is the structural racism in the institution. So when a black mother's there versus a white mother versus a Hispanic mother, it doesn't matter how much they make, they're treated differently in the system. So when I see a 50% decrease, I think, how does that system treat that mother? So maybe we can kind of reflect on that. We see that in the hospital here in, with regards to First Nations mothers. And then secondly, based on a lot of the work, or a lot of the learning that I had with uh, our partners at the Nandaway Wigmake, it's that the dads do play a role, and that I feel like the dads are failing in creating a supportive culture, right? So, not to force this, but can, how do we engage men in there to create that environment to support the women during this transition, to make a, a more safe environment for if that's a problem, I don't know. No, I think men are, are generally a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Being a man and, and hearing a lot of that all the time, like, I know I'm a problem. Right? How do we bring us into the solution? <laughs> Oh no, I was going to say, I don't, I don't need a microphone, but I was just going to echo that comment as, as I transition currently right now from, you know, breastfeeding to bo bottle feeding nursing. with, with from, from nursing, from nursing to, to um, giving him pump milk. That's my husband's biggest thing is now he can have that opportunity to bond with the baby and it's such a big change and that's something that he really missed out on, especially as the kids get crazy and wild. It's the only time they sit still and actually have that bonding moment. So I think it is really important to consider that when we're also thinking about trade-offs with feeding, and that comes back to the very first talk on trade-offs, is that engagement with men as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move, transition to our next panel.
Um, but lots to talk about in coffee break.